Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I just have a couple of quick announcements coming up. Uh, first of all, if you live within driving distance of Columbus, you want to come here for uh, our Women's Health Symposium, which we do once a year, and it will be this year on Saturday, April 29th. We have a guest instructor, Mary Marshall. She's a member of our provider network, lives about an hour and a half away from Columbus, registered nurse, knowledgeable lady, great teacher. And if you want to know all about hormones and um, uh, bone health and breast health and mammograms and all kinds of things like that, you definitely want to be here for that. Uh, second thing, summer semester, it is time to take enrollments and two things, two or three things to be aware of. Number one, uh, diet and lifestyle course, we only use the celebrity instructors once a year in the summertime. That's when Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Moss, Dr. Goldhammer, all the people you would love to learn personally from, we only feature them once a year and that's in the summertime. Uh, another thing that's unique this summer is I'm going to teach a course on cancer, cancer diagnosis, diet and cancer prevention of cancer, treatment of cancer, diet as an intervention tool, alternative treatments, etc. Uh, this summer semester and then we're offering statistics one and two starting in May and then running through uh, fall semester because it's a kind of a monstrous course to do uh, both stats one and stats two. So if you are interested in those things you should email me at pampopper at msn.com. All right, Repatha is a drug that you might have heard about. It was um, applauded so much by the medical community there was even an article in the Columbus Dispatch about it. It's a new drug, relatively new drug. It's given by injection twice per month and it's part of a class of drugs that is designed to push down LDL levels to literally unprecedented levels, uh, much more than can be achieved by just taking a regular statin drug. So here's the $64,000 question. After I read the article in the Columbus newspaper, is this really a significant breakthrough in the people who are treated for high cholesterol or is this just one more harmless and useless drug? So I managed to find a study that was published in 2015 and patients were randomized to either take Repatha in addition to standard drug treatment or to just take standard statin drugs. At the end of an average of 11.1 .1 months of follow-up, the patients were assessed for cholesterol levels, safety and side effects, and cardiovascular events, which included heart attack, stroke, and death. Patients treated with Repatha had a 61% reduction in LDL cholesterol, dropping from an average of 120 to 48. More adverse events were reported in the Repatha group. That's not actually quite um, very surprising, but 60.3% reported side effects and 7.5% of them reported serious side effects. Well, now here's the question. How effective was the new drug? Well, cardiovascular events were reported in 29 patients taking Repatha and 31 of the patients taking standard therapy, a reduction of 1.23%. So would taking the drug longer make a difference? Because remember, the follow-up here was only 11.1 .1 months. Well, the researchers wrote, and this is a quote from the article, an unanswered question is whether a reduction in the LDL cholesterol level with a PCSK9 inhibitor will lead to a reduction in cardiovascular events, end of quote. In other words, based on that study, nobody knew. So what did this study tell us? It basically said that taking this extra drug with all of its side effects resulted in a risk reduction of 1.23% for those taking the drug. Well, the one that was reported in the Columbus newspaper and got all the attention recently is a newer and longer term study which reported that the benefits of Repatha were much greater. Like previous studies, Repatha was shown to lower cholesterol levels significantly, so that was the same. 59% uh, was what this study reported, but uh, the risk of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, hospitalization for unstable angina, and coronary revascularization was reported as a drop in 15 to 20%. Now that's not huge, but at least it sounds promising. But if we look at the real reduction in absolute terms rather than relative terms, uh, it was only 1.5%. Now, to put this in context of what this means to people in the general public, in order to prevent three heart attacks, strokes, or cardiovascular deaths, 200 people have to take Repatha for two years. The cost for this minimal effect, and this just kind of blows your mind, $14,000 per year per patient, or a little bit more. 
Um, now, in addition to all that, the, the um, researchers concluded, quote, the effect of Repatha on cardiovascular morbidity and mortality has not been determined. In other words, we still don't know. This is a lot of money to spend on a drug that has such a minimal effect. As for side effects, I went to the drug company's website to see what they said, and here's what they said. Common side effects include runny or stuffy nose, upper respiratory infections, flu, back pain, injection site reactions, rash and hives, cough, UTIs, sinus infections, headache, muscle pain, high blood pressure, diarrhea, and stomach upset. This is in addition to having unknown long-term benefits and such a tiny reduction in the risk of bad things happening. Now, it's hard to imagine how anybody can actually be excited about this drug. It's expensive. It doesn't improve health outcomes for 98.5% of the people who take it. This means that those 98.5% of people all harm, no benefit, while only 1.5% actually experience any benefit whatsoever, and it is pretty small. But the drug, by the drug company's own admission, the effect on cardiovascular morbidity and mortality is unknown calls into question the benefit that even that small majority um, uh, uh, enjoys. So the bottom line is that there just isn't any justification for the use of this drug for the purpose of aggressive lowering of LDL cholesterol. So anyway, sometimes it's fun to check out what all the fuss is about when something gets this much attention. Okay, so moving on to another topic. I have some really bad news for the paleo folks today. A group of anthropologists extracted and analyzed plaque from the teeth of the remains of five Neanderthals that were found in a cave in northern Spain. It's estimated that the five people lived there about uh, 50,000 years ago, or five Neanderthals lived there 50,000 years ago. What were these people eating? Well, a plant-based diet that included things like mushrooms and pine nuts and moss. Evidence shows that some of the things that they were consuming were plants that were being used for medicinal purposes. Analysis of the dental plaque showed that it contained significant amounts of carbohydrate and starch granules and very little residue from protein and fat from animal foods. The plaque also included compounds that indicated that the Neanderthals were actually cooking some of the vegetables that they ate. The, and this was a quote from one of the um, anthropologist, he said, the idea that Neanderthals were largely meat eaters has been hard for me to accept, given their membership in a mainly vegetarian clade. It's exciting to see this new set of techniques applied to understanding their paleo diet. In this case, paleo diet meaning plant-based diet. These people did not eat animals. Now, in addition to the food, well, well, not a lot of animals, I should say, they ate a plant-based diet with very tiny amounts of animal food. Now, in addition to food compounds, the plaque contained chemicals from plants like yarrow, chamomile, poplar, and a penicillium mold, which taste better, and they don't really have any nutritional value or calorie value. So, researcher Karen Hardy thinks that this shows that the Neanderthals had figured out how to use plants as medicine. Herbalists today use these very same plants for medicinal purposes. So, Poplar is a source of aspirin, for example. Yarrow is used for conditions like fever, cold, gastrointestinal discomfort, um, and to relieve toothaches. Penicillium mold produces penicillin, and since one of the um, Neanderthals had evidence of an abscessed tooth, apparently they had figured out that this was a way to treat that particular condition. So the Neanderthals ate plants, and they used plants for medicinal purposes. They didn't eat very much meat. It's just the opposite of what the paleo folks tell us. Uh, but it is consistent with what we see in the remaining to gather populations around the world today. Um, still, people who live in these indigenous tribes, they have access to a lot of animals, but they don't eat as many animals. They really do eat a plant-based diet. So sorry about that, paleo folks. Your hypothesis and your statements about what people used to eat really do not hold up. And I'll add one other thing to this. I can't help but comment on this because this paleo thing still occupies a lot of my time as I answer questions here in the office, and that is that I do not understand why we have to spend so much time. I mean, it's one thing for, for anthropologists and paleontologists to go out and look at excavations and how people lived, but in terms of the nutrition community, why do we spend so much time figuring out what people ate tens of thousands or millions of years ago? Because we have great data on what people eat right now and what their health outcomes are. So all the hypothesizing after a while becomes pretty tiresome as far as I'm concerned. All right, that is all for today, and I will be back to you on Thursday with more news, and of course, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it too.